uh, good evening to everybody and uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all uh, this evening on this uh, uh, interesting event uh, this session is going to be on history and uh, given the nature and the importance of understanding our past and uh, learning uh, uh, the constant developments that take place in terms of new evidences and new technologies that make us you know uh, uh, give us the ability to identify and uh, interpret history this is a constant process and it's it's a very very important and interesting you know subject that one needs to be uh, needs to give a lot of attention to it uh, today we are looking at the uh, saraswati civilization saraswati river which is the mythical Saraswati River that's been uh, mentioned in Rig Veda and researchers of, of over nearly a century, researchers have constantly uh, uh, looked at it, tried to identify and locate and, and correlate the importance of Saraswati to Indian civilization. Uh, over a hundred years ago, uh, uh, over a hundred years ago, the Indus Valley uh, ruins were uh, identified by various uh, archaeologists and researchers, and that through uh, a lot of information uh, and across the world. Uh, the Indus Valley civilization is, uh, at that point of time, seen to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, occupied a vast area of nearly 1 million square kilometers. And uh, the matured phase of the civilization has spread uh, considerably around the Indus Valley and across further east as well as on the borders of Iran. Uh, this session is to, you know, examine uh, the importance of, uh, or identify the evidences that have now resurfaced or surfaced now, to look at where Saraswati River that has been mentioned in the Vedas as actually geographically where is it located, what has been the connections with early Vedic or pre-Vedic civilizations, and is there adequate geophysical, geographical, and remote sensing evidences that corroborate the actual route and flow of Saraswati River? And of course, correlate that with, is there any connection with the Indus Valley? And uh, has the Indus Valley scripts been identified? Uh, and can that be related to whatever that's been found on Saraswati civilization? It's going to be the subject of today's talk. We have a very eminent, uh, you, know, you know, researcher who spent his lifetime on researching the Saraswati civilization, Dr. S. Kalyan Raman. He is a former senior executive in the Asian Development Bank. In 1995, he took, his, took a voluntary retirement and devoted his entire time to researching the Saraswati river and civilization. His passion is to look at identifying and getting the Saraswati River to flow again and then go about, you know, working towards linking all the rivers in India. Uh, uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman has uh, written enormous number of papers and his research extensively on this subject. Therefore, we are going to be listening to him in the first 35 minutes. I request Dr. Kalyan Raman to limit himself to 35 minutes on the first part of his lecture. And uh, thereafter, we would be having a panel discussion with eminent uh, uh, academics. Uh, we have with us Dr. Ganesh Devi, who is uh, India's leading linguist. Uh, he is uh, also a uh, historian, anthropologist, and an activist. So his experience and uh, his uh, research uh, knowledge will enable us to understand, particularly in the context of the Indus Valley scripts and the linkages to the subsequent development of Indian languages as well. Uh, we also have with us uh, Professor Ravi Kori Setter, who's uh, the uh, eminent uh, uh, Professor Emeritus under, of UGC, is also Senior Academic Fellow of the Indian Council of Academic Research. He retired recently from the Karnataka University in Dharwad. And uh, he will be looking at from the archaeological perspective and uh, and examine what uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman would be presenting. We have the fourth person with us is Dr. S. Kalyan uh, S. Ram Mohan, who is the vice president of uh, uh, founding member and vice president of uh, 
the uh, Peninsula Foundation. And he would he uh, assist Dr. Kalyan Raman in this research, but in his own rights, he is, he is uh, very accomplished uh, in the study of culture and Indian history and uh, extremely proficient both in Tamil and Sanskrit in terms of literary knowledge. He is a former special secretary of the Indian Railway Combine Service. So without any more, uh, taking any more time, let me uh, start the proceedings. For so that few uh, points, everybody, kindly everyone, while the speaker is on, kindly keep your mics on mute. I request everybody to keep your mics on mute. And second is, uh, well, once the lecture is over, when we start the panel discussions, you can actually put up your questions on the chat mode. You could also raise your hand and we will initiate, along with the panel discussion, the question answer sessions will also continue. So we will have uh, the first 35 minutes with a lecture from Dr. Kalyan Raman. The next 55 minutes will be on a panel discussion and thereafter we will conclude the proceedings. Uh, I let me now invite Dr. Kalyan Raman to take the floor and uh, can uh, start the proceedings. Dr. Kalyan Raman. I will share the screen. Can you see the screen of you? Yes, we can see. I can see. Okay, thank you. See, I will be covering a lot of new ground. After all, we have been uh, searching the civilization for the last 100 plus years. And also found the river. The new areas of uh, inquiry are mentioned by Giovanni Vera. R.D., an Italian archaeologist, together with Michael Hansen, an architecture specialist who has studied Mohenjo-daro very deeply. They have a new theory that the Mohenjo-daro stupa is not a stupa but a ziggurat, an ancient temple. Then we have remote sensing data that aids us. And more important now is some archaeometallurgical evidences that have come out together with the importance of the Arunmala Kannadi, the bronze mirror that was invented in the civilization. We have some work that has been done on, on glaciology and some research has been done on the navigation aspects, the boat building, thanks to the work of French archaeologist C. E. Alexandre, who found a shipwreck on the Red Sea near Suez Canal of a Sioux boat possibly from Kerala, dated to 1900 before Common Era. And more and most important thing is that we are now able to say that it is no longer the Indus Valley Civilization, but Saraswati Sindhu Civilization, because about 2000 sites have been found on the banks of the river Saraswati, constituting 80% of the entire number of sites. So we may have to relook at the description of the Indus Valley. Now we have the most important information is that have, we have about 8000 inscriptions of the Indus script. 2000 have been found from the Persian Gulf area and about 500,000 have been found from the ancient Near East and about 6000 have been documented from the sites of the Saraswati river basin mostly. Of course, they include Mojada or Harappa significantly. So, this is a new background. So, we will start with the importance of the river. river, not as a mythical river or as a sacred river, but as a maritime waterway. So, a maritime trade was possible using this waterway, the Persian Gulf, Tigris Euphrates, Mediterranean, and right up to Caspian. See, so this is the background of the trade activity that went on with creating the Bronze Age Revolution of the fourth millennium before Common Era. So you can uh, see my email address. Any queries you can send an email to me, or take a look at the details provided in the academia.edu link with about 2,500 monographs on the subject of civilization. And of course, in the script, figures prominently in that site.
So the most uh, significant fact is that the area was not called the Saraswati, it is called Meluha. It is found from a cylinder seal which says in Akkadian, it belongs to a Shu Ilishu who says I am an interpreter of Meluha. So the Akkadian trader on whose lap this Shu Ilishu is seated introduces two merchants from Meluha. One is a male carrying a goat, second is a female carrying a liquid measure. These are clear indicators of Meluha. You can also get an idea of the language they spoke from this seal. The goat is Mel Mreka, goat. The rebus rendering is Melaku or Blecha, copper. So he is a copper trader. The lady is carrying a Ranku. A liquid measure, Ranko means tin. So she is a tin trader. So copper and tin traders jointly are transacting some trade transaction with the Akkadian armorer. The armory is indicated by the moon sign. Moon indicates that he is an armorer. Okay. Now, some progress has been made in the decipherment of the script thanks to the 8000 inscriptions available, which is a significant corpus for any cybernetic work. This is enough to conclusively formulate a hypothesis and make it falsifiable. Here is a picture of a pectoral worn possibly on the neck by the wearer. I suggest that this is a professional calling card of a maritime trader. And the overflowing pot, which is the major dominant message, is low means overflowing, kanda means water, overflowing water, overflowing pot is low kanda. Low kanda in Marathi means metal equipment. Low kanda, loha is metal, kanda equipment. Kanda also is water, kanda is equipment. And the details of the unicorn have also been cracked. It is a very remarkable hypertext formation like the HTTP that we use, hypertext transfer protocol. A number of hieroglyphic parts are joined together. There is a one horn, there is a ear, there is a face of a goat, the body of a bull and with highlighted parts of the pannier on the shoulder of the bull, the back of the bull, the thigh of the bull. If each of these represent hieroglyphic information of Indescript, like the Egyptian hieroglyphs, we can read the Rebus readings in Meluha, which is the language of the times. Of course, we will come to the linguistic part of the Meluha in course of time. But basically, the indicators from this pictorial professional calling card is that he is trading in metal equipment, he is a maritime trader because there is in the standard device, the bottom part is called a, a churning container because he is doing a lathe operation, churning into creating a perforation of a bead. Top portion is the kunda, is a lathe, kunda means fine gold and the one horn is singi, singin, forward thrusting, undulating horn in Santali language and singi in Samskrutam means ornament gold. So he is a worker in both fine gold and ornament gold, 24 karat gold and 22 karat gold. The rings on the neck indicate kodium in Gujarati, kod is a workshop. The pannier is kantala, kantala is a pannier, kantala means a maritime and a boat. The body also has got a very significant indicator. Pata is the back, Pada is a metals manufactory, Padnavis. Fadnis, who are the chief minister of Maharashtra, Fadnis, they were metal manufacturing in charge, Fadnavis. So we have the Kunda lathe, Kunda is a treasure, Kunda is a turner, a lapidary, pine gold. He is a lapidary working with these materials and trading in the maritime transaction. Now we have remarkable evidence coming from the archaeological work of the sea Alexandria of France 
who found a shipwreck in Ayat Sukuna on the Red Sea, north of the Suez Canal. There they found a sewn boat. The boat, the planks are joined together with coir. So they searched for the source of the coir and found that it could possibly have come from Kerala. The date of the shipwreck is 1900 before Common Era. So we now have the investigation done with reference to the navigability of the waterways. So I will play the YouTube a few links just to give an idea of the nature of research that has been done and ongoing by this uh, Italian marine archaeological team. They thwart my wish to smash down those sturdy walls of Troy. Nine of the great Zeus years have rolled on past. Ships' planks have rotted, the ropes have frayed. Back home, our wives and children wait for us. The work for which we came remains undone. Le texte de mer que l'on vient d'entendre, tiré de l'Iliade, nous apprend que les bateaux grecs de la flotte achéenne de la guerre de Troie étaient des bateaux assemblés par ligature. C'est ce que l'on appelle des bateaux cousus. Ce sont les fameux liens. So it takes them to Kerala. The backwaters, a network of lagoons and brackish lakes connected by man-made canals that stretches some 200 kilometers long and 30 wide. Inland from the Malabar coast in the state of Kerala. This network, fed by some 40 coastal rivers, represents an important means of communication along an inhospitable coast that is thick with tropical forest. It is an important factor in the local economy for the transport of goods and, these days, as a tourist attraction. It's lined up. These are the elements of this primitive craft. In the Malayalam language, Katumaram means tied boat. It's the origin of the word catamaran. Some wooden examples of this craft are still used along the coast. In 1697, the English pirate and adventurer, William Dampier, described them On the Coromandel coast, they are called d'origine soit à peine discernable, n'est plus que résiduelle et on pourrait facilement les confondre avec des bateaux cousus d'origine alors que ce n'est pas le cas. On retrouve aussi dans les backwaters des grandes barques qui appartiennent à la famille des Ketubalam. Ces barques atteignent généralement 8 à 12 mètres. The stitching is done first on the inside of the craft. This includes placing rolls of coconut fiber so that they will be packed in by the lashings to ensure a watertight fit. Threading the stitch through the previously pierced holes is done with the help of a long needle made from a blade of palm frond. Gradually the lashings are blocked and then carefully hammered, pack and tight. With each passage, the lashing is grasped outside the hull and pulled firmly, using a mallet as a tightening. The lashing is then blocked before being threaded back through to the interior. The rhythm of the work follows the beat of the mallet. The final touches require filling the stitch holes with a plug of tightly packed coconut fibers. I will stop sharing. Back to the PowerPoint. Repairs can often involve the replacement of frames. These are in turn adjusted and notched to allow space for the plank stitching. The
So we have seen the importance of the Kerala boat. Now we will take a look at the stupa. In front of the stupa is the great bath. I call it Pushkarini. Giovanni Veraldi suggests the construction was. Yeah, are, are you able to hear? Yeah, you can select the full screen for the power. Yeah. This is one. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Look at the structure of the the architectural framework of the stupa. So we have got some surrounding settlements, possibly for people to stay here, pay homage to the whatever the temple that existed. The nature of the construction of the Great Bath on the Pushkarini uses the same type of bricks that were used for this structure of the ziggurat. On top, it's cylindrical, cylindrical structure, the brick structure. So it is not a stupa or a dagoba, a dhatagarba. It is not, we could have thought as a model for the Buddhist stupa. But this is dated to, according to Veraldi and also Michael Hansen, to the same date as the Mojadaro civilization of the Great Bath. Okay. So this has got to be further investigated. Let's take a look at the ziggurats of the time, 3000-3500 in the ancient Near East. One of the oldest ziggurats is the ziggurat of Ur, which compares with the structure of the steps, stairways going towards it. After all, it's, it's a mystical structure trying to reach up to the heavens. That's what the documentation says, which is recorded in a later day bronze model available in the Louvre Museum called the Sikh Shamshi Bronze with a 60 by 40 centimeter base. Two people are shown offering a morning oblation to the sun divinity in front of this. Ziggurats. There are two ziggurats fronting each other. There is also a water body. There are some epigraph pictographical messaging systems together with the 4 plus 4, 8 blobs of bronze, possibly in guards or something like that. This uh, bronze model has been well documented. The inscription has been read. It is to celebrate. Shamshi of the sun divinity of the Akkadian times. A similar tradition exists in the Khandashri Tarpana offered every year after completing the Sandhya Vandanam of that particular Upakarma. We have a Rahi Chatra Zigurat it is not a stupa, but it is a Shiva temple. Almost following some kind of architectural similarity with the Ur Ziggurat and the Mojadaro Ziggurat. This is the Ai Chatra. Ai Chatra is a very important site in the copper hoard culture and the painted graveyard culture. We will see about that. Now, the third component of the discovery so far has been 2000 sites are not on the river Sindhu, but on river Saraswati. In fact, if you, say, if you mark the sites on the on a plain map, the river will emerge automatically because almost all the sites are on the river bank, as you can see from this map. And they extend into the run of Kutch, and a number of sites also are there in Gujarat. And particularly the remarkable presence of the run of Kutch sites like Dhalavira, Surkotada are important pointers to the fact that this river went into the Arabian Ocean and provided a link from the Rana of Kutch to the Persian Gulf. Now, let us take a look at the list of the, the archaeological sites from satellite maps 4000 before Common Era, 3700 before Common Era, and 2500 before Common Era. 2500 is the mature phase of the Saraswati Sindhu civilization. 
look at the packed sites which have now extended beyond the Sindhu river into the Persian Gulf coastal sites and also into the area of Gandhara in Afghanistan. So this is all the progress of the civilizational sites and movement of people took place. A broad spectrum analysis from 4000 before Common Era to 2500 before Common Era. Now, what is the new light on the civilization? As I told you, we now have 8000 inscriptions. They have all been brought together into three volumes called Epigraphia Indescript. Now we have uh, Epigraphia Indica added by 8000 inscriptions. If this can be read, we will have significant information to rewrite the economic history of ancient India. And it is possible to make it get it done. So significant progress has been made. You can go through my monographs on the decipherment of the script using the simple principle that was followed by the Egyptian hieroglyphs, rebus, similar sounding words. So only thing is there is a distinct difference between the way the Egyptian hieroglyphs became syllabic, whereas in the Indian context, the Indus script continued to be only pictographic, logographic, word for word compilation, no syllabic transactions involved. There are also indications that they were working with copper from the K3 mines. After all, the 1900 BC shipwreck in Ain Sukuna could have been carrying some of this copper and tin trade. The Ajurveda Magna mentioned in the Mitra in Samhita called the Vasur Dharadi Tantra that is at the end of the celebration Purnahuti is offered and in that offering they say what they have done they have said they purified copper purified silver purified gold purified iron and so on so the process of Yagna is a process of purification of metal work in intense fire which can run for 5 days continuous 5 days and nights Ahoratra at the working temperature of 1500 degrees per centigrade. The priest is a priest king? No, he is a priest. He wears some hieroglyphs, he wears a pele on the forehead and also on the right shoulder. It is a gold bead. Pot, pota is a gold bead. Potru is a purifier priest, one of the 16 priests of the Rigveda. He also wears a shawl with trefoils. Trefoil also is three dhatu, three minerals. And the description of the investiture ceremony of the priests is mentioned in the Satapada Brahmana called the Tithyatavi Ishti, where the ladies stitch embroidered copper, silver, and gold coins onto the Uttariyam to constitute a trifoil. So he is a priest, he is a Rigvedic priest. So the Vedic transactions seem to have been taking place and is evidence later on archaeologically. But more importantly, from an economic point of view, a remarkable work has been done by Angus Madison before the European Union was constituted. He found that in one common era, India accounted for 33% of the world GDP. How come? What was happening before that time? So for 3000 years before the one common era, there has been a lot of activity creating wealth of the nation, particularly in metal work, in silk and cotton. Cotton fiber was invented 7th millennium BC. So cotton fiber, you are the clothiers of the world using cotton and also silk. So the constituents of the richness, riches were trade, metal work and cloth, silk and cotton cloth. So the area of activity around Harappa, Ariyupiya, surrounds a seven river basin called Sindhava, Sapta Sindhava. 
which is a very classic representation in the brilliant map prepared by Schwarzberg, University of Chicago, where the, all the name, river names are mentioned. Sindhu, Vitasta, Sikni, Parushni, Vipasa, Sutudri, Saraswati. This is where Saraswati comes in as a geographical, geographically mapped evidence of the Rigvedic times. Later on, of course, this river has been fully mapped from the Himalayas right up to Gujarat using satellite imagery. So there is a Devi Suktam which venerates a remarkable number of divinities. And this particular Suktam, the divinity invoked is a person called Thvashta. Thvashtra. Thvashta is Tacham, Tatam, a goldsmith, a carpenter. And this Thvashta becomes the Tuisto, the father of the Germanic people. He is the founder of the Germanic people. So there was some kind of a contact that existed between the Milha Saraswati River Valley and Germanic people of ancient times. The Tvashta with three faces, three seras, surrounded by these animals which are also in the hieroglyphs signifying wealth resources that was working on. The buffalo horn that he wears is Tatar. Tatar, he said Tatar, Tatar, he said Rashta. You know, we will not go into the details that can be a draft over for a linguistic analysis a little later in a separate session. Tolavera signboard, it's a magnificent discovery. Ten signs, possibly fronting a gold gate and the working area, and this, the hieroglyphs seem to signify an Arkasala, an Arkasala a goldsmith workshop, working with variety of metals. And this is the general area in which the transactions are possibly a market street, comparable to the Mojada market street of the Olavera. So the details of the inscription and the river's readings can be gone through separately. The link is available here. I will send the PPT for whomsoever is interested. So as I told you, the professional calling card of the pectoral is repeated in a huge large sign inscription, a tablet, where the last sign, the third line from the bottom, from the top, indicates a squirrel. A squirrel is a shesh tree. Shesh tin is a guild master. So it's a guild master's tablet indicating the work done by the guild in metalwork. So, Shesti Kara is also a squirrel. Kar means a blacksmith in Kashmiri. So, he's a guild master of blacksmith guild. Anthropomorph professional calling cards have been found with a Brahmi inscription which seems to indicate that there is some kind of a link with maritime activity because the one of the words used is Majiya could be a boatman of the historic times when the Brahmin script overlaid on the anthropomorph of older times which shows the own horn young bull which is as we have seen worker in ornament gold and fine gold. So the context of the cipher is very clear. They were using hieroglyphs to constitute hypertext. So the face of a person is shown Mukha. Muha is a face. Muha means an ingot. Quantity is taken out of a smelter. Then we have the trunk of an elephant, we have the horns of a zebu, we have the scarves on the shoulder, we have the tail of a cobra hood. All are hieroglyphs, which can be read the way Narmer's palette was read for Egyptian hieroglyphs. This can be read as Rebus renderings in Meloha. We have surprisingly 14 in guards. Of three are shown here. One of the pure Tindian gods, 19% purity, was found in a shipwreck in Sisrael in Haifa. It carries the face of a woman, Muha. He says, Muha is in god. What in god? Liquid measure, Ranku, Tin, Karas, Dhatu, Dhatu, mineral. Tin, mineral, in god. This is the inscription. This is not Creighton, this is in the script. So we have now got work done 
to identify the sources of resources which came up to Rakhigadi, which was the central point, the capital of the civilization, because it was the midpoint between the Saraswati River Valley and the Ganga Yamuna Dope. So it was in the water divide, where water flowing west of Rakhigadi will flow westwards from the trough of the fault line of the Arbuda Mountains. Water falling east of the Rakhigadi will flow eastwards like Ganga Yamuna. So that way Rakhigadi became the capital of the copper horde culture. So we also have Evidences from the Far East, Dong Song Bronze Drums containing indescript inscriptions of a frog, of a peacock, of an elephant, of a tree. They are all indescript hieroglyphs indicating metal work. How were the ancient courses the river Saraswati found? Thanks to the work of the satellite imagery and reconstruction based on geological theorization of a river that is proved to exist in 72 richas of the Rigveda, mapped into the map of ancient India. But the most important part of it is the glaciology. We are, as we are sitting here, the Indian plate is moving northwards at a rate of 6 centimeters per 6 centimeters per year. And it is lifting up the Eurasian plate about 1 centimeter every year, creating the Himalayan ranges, which are the youngest mountain range in the world. It is still growing, we do not know when it will stop. This Tandava and Rithyam, when it will stop, we do not know. But that is going to cause Waters from the major rivers, Mekong, Iravati, Salween, Brahmaputra, Ganga, Sindhu, Saraswati, they all give us water. So, this is the flow of the Indian plate in plate tectonics, creating the, Eurasian, the Himalayan mountains by jetting into the Eurasian plate and lifting it up. We have seen the impact of tectonics, the fault lines of the sutlej, fault lines of the Yamuna on the Shivalik ranges indicate clearly how sutlej river went westwards abandoning Saraswati, Yamuna went eastwards abandoning Saraswati, Yamuna joined Ganga, sutlej joined Sindhu. So this is the story of the civilization that we have found so far. Work is ongoing to rejuvenate the river using the Sarada river waters which will flow across Ganga and Yamuna through aqueducts and flow into the present day Rajasthan canal and take the waters up to Gujarat. So that will be a day when our children and all of us can go to Ahmedabad and take a dip in the Saraswati, river Saraswati five years from now. Namaskaram. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman, that's for that excellent uh, presentation. Very. Uh, uh, I will stop the sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Compact and uh, very nicely covered. So let me uh, bring uh, the discussions now, which is on, on this very interesting presentation. Uh, firstly, of course, uh, to establish. Uh, history, it, 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 we uh, history is disciplinary and therefore one needs to go into uh, uh, interpretation of evidences and evidences are the foremost requirement. So archaeology forms a very, very important uh, element. And of course, we have epigraphy, uh, you know, which will contribute to that. Apart from that, today, of course, uh, genetics contributes immensely to you know, identifying the populations, migratory patterns, and settlements that have developed over many centuries as well. But in terms of, uh, uh, you know, evidence from a space-based uh, uh, remote sensing and analysis of the river, I think a lot more, as uh, a lot of research papers indicate, a lot more needs to be done to establish uh, uh, you know, uh, the Saraswati River's course, particularly that there has been a river, that there has been, you know, uh, a, a Paleo River uh, evidences uh, indicate that there could have been, you know, water flows in uh, Thar Desert uh, in that region. And uh, whether the river originated from Himalayas or whether they were uh, 
uh, tributaries or, uh, or uh, monsoon fed rivers is something that needs to be uh, you know uh, researched uh, continuously uh, much more but uh, there are some uh, uh, researches that have been carried out which uh, which identify the greater runoff catch and that water fresh water river river deltas have actually uh, indicated uh, uh, there is something other than the indus delta that has contributed to you know the, the uh, evidences that are available there so uh, in this context let me first invite professor ravi kurisetta as an archaeologist uh, how do you uh, uh, look at uh, what uh, you know dr kalyanraman has presented in terms of interpreting and uh, how the enormous wealth of evidence that's available from indus valley excavations from the harappan uh, evidences starting off from the early stage to the matured phase and how do we actually now correlate that with the saraswati river part dr ravi i am mean, professor ravi yeah good evening everybody at the outset outset i must say that i am not an indus specialist i have been um, looking at more deeper past of the indian subcontinent and more particularly in the peninsula of south india but as a teacher i am quite familiar with uh, whatever research that has been happening with respect to our understanding of uh, the indus civilization and uh, we look at uh, some of these modern theories and especially i will um, restrict myself to uh, commenting on material cultural evidence because the linguistics is not my forte and uh, of course professor ganesh devi will be the right person to comment on some of these interpretations about decipherment of the indus script so far as i know there is no unanimity and these have been uh, very hypothetical statements and there is no clear evidence with respect to continuity of the civilization because the term revolution itself that has been used in the title of the presentation also creates some problem because this is not a kind of a civilization which did not look back but what we see the transformations were taking place from time to time and then um, you know there are gaps in our knowledge of uh, its geographical continuity when it comes to focusing on the uh, saraswati river and the number of settlements or density of settlements that are located along the so called saraswati river uh, no doubt there is a greater density no doubt there is there are more number of uh, harappan related sites on the indian side of this uh, northwestern part of the indian subcontinent there may be fewer and fewer but when it when we have to look at the origins of a civilization from the neolithic basis we have to go westwards towards the balochistan uh, mountain ranges there are these valleys you know quetta valley Bol bolan valley and those regions have given evidence for clear transition from hunting gathering to early agriculture and that is where we see some vestiges which actually foretell the developments that took place in the indus plains so the kachi plains to indus plains there is a time gap of about more than 4000 years or so and there are some remnants uh, you know which also help us understand that for a very very long time it was thought that there was a lot of stimulus from outside from the western part of asia or southwest asia and we always link uh, you know indus valley civilization with uh, bahrain and then mesopotamia and so on and so forth and the geographical parameters that we look at when it comes to understanding the man land relationship the factors that govern the emergence of urban economy we see that it is well defined uh, geographically it is controlled by the resources you know that were exploited by these urban um, you know trading economy because procurement um, you know processing and distribution you know played a very important role in it in all its ramifications with respect to its spread and it was mostly westbound civilization because beyond the frontiers eastern frontiers that we see the indus ganga divide and the aravallis and the malwa region and then saurashtra further east of these uh, you know provinces in india we do not have an inkling of evidence of its influence and contemporary cultures were all primitive or early agro pastoral you know cultures that we see whether it is malwa jorwe Uh, you know or the southern neolithic and so on for a very long time uh, there were suggestions that even the kolar gold fields supplied uh, you know gold and all that but with increasing amount of research that has taken place with respect to resources you know that were located 
and in systematic transect surveys that have been carried out by American archaeologists has clearly, you know, established the fact that it was, uh, you know, <clears throat> largely confined to the region west of the Aravallis, and then and prospered because of trading connections with Southwest Asia, Red Sea area, and so on and so forth. And with respect to this, um, um, you know, the Saraswati having been a, a living river at the time of uh, the Indus civilization, there are lots of doubts, even including the idea that whether it is a river of Himalayan origin or it originates in, in sub-Himalayas, and then the recent tectonic evidences are certainly not suggestive of any kind of drastic changes in the landscapes and so on. And then uh, Dr. Waldia's work also has given very clear indications of the presence of, uh, you know, uh, fresh water. Uh, there is there are a strata of freshwater, brackish water, freshwater, brackish water kind of situation, and then the 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 um, OSL optical stimulated uh, luminescence dating, which was carried out on the sediments which were sampled from the the Saraswati basin. Uh, by the scientists of the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, very clearly say that as early as 35,000 years ago, this river had dried away. And they don't refer to the, you know, the terms like Saraswati or any such thing. Uh, they refer to these, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Tautang River and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of these, you know, confusions, you know, prevailing. And then some of these theories that we are now uh, proposing are not based on adequate evidence. And that is one problem I am faced with in understanding uh, the continuity. There are, of course, clues that, you know, we talk of two urbanizations in the Indian subcontinent with uh, recent research in, in some of those post-Harappan uh, settlements are indicative of the fact that these post-Harappan settlements not only spread eastwards, but also spread north uh, westwards into Bactria and so on and so forth. And it is a continuation of the civilization. We did not transform or decline or whatever. And then that continuation was more even westwards uh, beyond the Balochistan into Iran, Afghanistan, and Bactria, and so on and so forth. So this is what I feel uh, that you know, <clears throat> material cultural evidence does not uh, reflect clear, uh, you know, widespread connections uh, of the Indus Valley civilization with the rest of the Indian Peninsula. You know, suggestions that you know there are you know suggestions that Kerala uh, boating uh, boats were you know the models for. Uh, the boats that were built in the Indus Valley civilization and so on. But it, it, it has to be reflected in some kind of material evidence even beyond the Harappan province the, you know, that we have um, you know, so far. Uh, when this urban economy was prosperous uh, across the northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent, the rest of the mainland Indian, Indian subcontinent was going through gradual transition from hunting gathering to early agro-pastoral way of life as reflected in uh, some of the sites in the Malwa area and some of the sites in central India and peninsular South India and so on. And this is where I uh, want to be very careful because as long as we don't build up adequate material cultural evidence, uh, we should not be venturing into you know, such interpretations as I understand. And with regard to stupa and so on, um, uh, maybe bricks or bricks are comparable. But the, as far as the dates that we know about the stupa and uh, my visit to Mahanjadaro also uh, was one such occasion where we went around this particular site uh, in the company of Mark Kanoir and uh, several other archaeologists from Pakistan and Afghanistan and so on. We feel that um, some little more, much more needs to be done to establish contemporaneity of the stupa structure, which may be a juggernaut also. But we do not have absolute dates to correlate them. Sometimes material cultural similarities uh, are not clear evidence of, you know, contemporaneity and so on. So this is my submission. Thank you, Professor Ravi. And uh, just in continuation of what you had actually uh, brought out uh, significantly is uh, that much of the evidence, as you say, lies around uh, the Indus River and it hasn't traveled uh, very much beyond uh, East uh, other than the Indus and uh, 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 Basin, say, Basin area, right? That is, but in the context of reason, one is uh, the uh, one reason that we could say is not adequate excavations or explorations have been done on the eastern side. I am raising this question because uh, to establish the fact that uh, 
the Indus Valley culture has actually spread across the subcontinent. Is that a possibility? And given the fact that there's lots of excavations, particularly in Kiladi in Peninsula, you're aware of the uh, what's happening in the peninsula right now. Uh, is there a, some kind of a similarity, much as we found in Dolavira and what is being now uh, seen here? And if, if that is there is no similarity, then is there a significant difference in the time frame? And are there separations and breaks in between these cultures? There is not only spatial, uh, you know, uh, and uh, not only spatial and temporal difference between these two provinces in the intermediate area. So between uh, Tamil Nadu, Kiladi, you know, Wagai River Basin and so on, and this northwestern part of the Indian subcontinent. I use the term Indian subcontinent because we'll have to use two terms like India, Pakistan and so on. So from in between these particular provinces, you know, if we have to claim continuity, geographical expansion, we need to have evidence in the intermediate geographical area. It's not forthcoming, you know, for the last hundred years and more, we have been systematically surveying. In fact, some of those chalcolithic, you know, agro-pastoral settlements which have been discovered uh, post-independence, uh, these, yes, these surveys were deliberately undertaken in order to yes, identify the Orient settlements. Hmm. Where were these Aryan settlements? But, you know, these search for Aryan settlements, you know, gave way to the identifying a distinctive cultural phase. And they were all simple societies, early agro-pastoral societies, which were well adapted to these uh, alluvial, you know, rocky landscapes. You know, the basin, rocky basins, unlike the Ganges Valley and the Indus Valley and its tributary system in the Indo-Ganga Indo Brahmaputra Basin, the mainland peninsula from north northern part of the Vindhyas to down south to Kanyakumari, we have a rocky landscape and the landscapes are very, very different. They are rich in variety of natural resources, but mm -hmm. agricultural productivity of this particular peninsular uh, India was relatively very, very low or very, very poor. And that is where we see uh, adaptation on a very simple agro-pastoral economy uh, very successfully taking place in these particular regions. And when we come further south into Tamil Nadu area, even the earliest agricultural populations that we see, which have been identified as Neolithic, they are not typically Neolithic sites. Mm -hmm. The Neolithic in Tamil Nadu is much younger than the Neolithic in the northern front provinces, either in north, southern Andhra Pradesh or you know, southern uh, eastern part of uh, uh, Karnataka province here. Uh, because it is gradual expansion of the Neolithic way of life, which began in peninsular Deccan around 3,200, 3,500 years ago. And then it established itself in the core area, in the central part of the you know, Indian peninsula, uh, midway between the Eastern Ghats and the Western Ghats. It is semi-arid grassland area and an area which was poorly equipped with uh, you know, natural uh, resources in terms of uh, food crops. And early agriculture in this area was characterized by adoption of local millets. Mm. Local millets. We do not have cereals at all. Even introduction of rice into this area is much later in time. That takes place during the irony. With the gradual expansion of the Mauryan economy uh, into southern India, you know, in order to have uh, greater interaction with the megalithic communities who had complete control of these uh, metal resources, precious metal resources. And that interaction was essential. And then uh, there was a limit for uh, Mauryan expansion into southern India as well. It did not go into, you know, Tamil Nadu or Kerala, you know, in those particular Pandya, Chera, and Chola territory at all. So that was an isolated area. And the ge geologically, it is very rich, but it is rich in terms of uh, gemstones, variety of gemstones. And you can see a number of these sites were specialized in production of beads, of you know, variety of beads and so on. And it was an adaptation um, following you know, uh, the introduction of iron technology into southern uh, part of peninsula, and that is the Tamil Nadu region and so on. Until then, we did not have an agricultural way of life you know, dating back to Neolithic times in Tamil Nadu. There are Neolithic stone axes. The mere presence of a stone self is not the presence of Neolithic. In fact, even in, in northern uh, parts of this Deccan, in the context of Neolithic in Karnataka, we look at the surplus production of Neolithic axes taking place at the beginning of early Iron Age. So some of those Neolithic sites which have 
numerous sites have been excavated in Karnataka in Andhra Pradesh and so on. We have these stone cells, no doubt, appearing at different at different levels and so on. But the intensity of production, you know, the courses towards urbanization in in southern India is as early as 13 to 1400, and that was the time uh, where we see the large scale industrial scale production of stone axes, which were put into a established trade network between and among these early agro pastoral settlements, and then we have the wheel being introduced where you have you know, efficiency um, you know, governing the production of uh, you know, large quantities of uh, ceramic, ceramic ware. So black and red ware, uh, wheel made red ware. Otherwise, most of Neolithic pottery in, uh, in the Neolithic context of Southern India was all handmade for well over nearly two million, uh, two millennium in the sense, nearly 2000 years of time span where we see the early phase of Neolithic emerging in this area was characterized by the production of uh, handmade pottery and then um, small scale production of uh, uh, dolerite uh, you know, stone axis or ground stone axis and so on. And early archaeologists were working, you know, they were guided by this particular concept that if you have a stone cell polished stone axe, it is perfect. But then we have advanced sufficiently in our understanding of the way in which the intensity of production increased towards uh, you know, uh, the middle of the second millennium. So we have identified a phase where we say before the iron metallurgy came into existence in this context, we have pre-iron iron age where surplus was being generated. And from about 18 to 1900 BCE, we have some of the Southwest Asian cereal crops getting introduced into Southern India via Northern Deccan. While there was a prosperous you know, agricultural economy, in the Indus Basin or Indus Saraswati Basin, none of it was, you know, introduced into this area. So the transition from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life in peninsular South India, east of the Aravallis, you know, is much slower and also very tardy progress. And over a period of two millennium, uh, two millennia, you see the transition taking place. So the Iron Age act expansion is much more rapid. And then it expands further into, you know, Tamil North, Tamil Nadu, and further interior Tamil Nadu, and so on. Vagai Basin or the Kiladi and all that, you know, the idea that in this influence or it is a continuation of Indus civilization into Tamil Nadu and all is not valid archaeologically. These are all hypothetical statements based on inadequate evidence. There is no chronological similarity, contemporaneity that can be established. First of all, try to fill in the gaps, geographical gaps in, you know, in the way in which, you know, if you want to invoke this kind of expansion southwards, you know, there is no tangible evidence whatsoever. In fact, as I said in the beginning, most of this expansion was towards Bactria and Southwest Asia and so on and so forth. Well, that's excellent. And, and evidence is the crux of the whole issue. Yes. And uh, we'll, I'll come back to the, the agriculture is, uh, is a very, very important area that we need to actually discuss as well. Uh, there is a time difference in a recent study in, in Britain, uh, in the British, along with the Indian scholars, they established there's a time difference almost two to 3,000 years between the agriculture establishment in the Indus uh, Gangetic uh, uh, area as compared to the peninsula. But they the peninsula agriculture developed in, in complete isolation, independently. Yes, you know, we have identified four, four independent centers of early agricultural evolution. One is peninsular South India, which was based on millet agriculture. Another mm -hmm. is Saurashtra, where we also have millet agriculture uh, in native millets. You know, not millets are also introduced into the Indian subcontinent. East Asian millets also came and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there is always a lot of uh, discussion going on about antiquity of rice cultivation in India. There are site one site called Aurodeva. And the earlier to that, there was one Koldiva in the Belen Valley. So they found some you know, anomalous radiocarbon dates were you know, leading you know, uh, uh, to this kind of uh, you know, claim that we have the oldest rice in India and so on. Why it should be the oldest rice in India? We have to have scientific evidence which establishes the fact that the rice that has been identified is a wild rice or a domesticated one. So morphological difference is very, very clear between the wild rice and the domesticated rice. And it takes place over a period of time. We need to see the morphological transition taking place not only in these you know, food crops 
from wild to the domesticated ones and cultivation and processes were playing an important role. And in fact, there is also a great debate about the cattle being you know, introduced into Southern India. And cattle, you know, there are multiple centers of cattle indigenous development. But if you look at some of the archaeological record in the Neolithic context, where we have the cattle bones, you know, predominant in the archaeological deposits, we see them, you know, they are all domesticated. Whereas there is there is no evidence to trace or reconstruct the you know transition from wild to domesticated uh, you know cattle. See the herding of animals, um, you know, may have taken place. But the archaeological sites that we have so far excavated have not taken us to the point where we can say this is the earliest phase which indicates transition from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life. That level of Neolithic you know, culture in peninsular India is still missing. We have, we have divided the Neolithic into three broad stages, early, middle and late, late transitions into Iron Age. Middle one is the most prosperous, like your mature Harappan phase and so on. And early phase has to be reflected, you know, in terms of gradual transition, both in terms of wild to domesticated food crops, wild to domesticated, you know, animals. You know, this is this phase is still missing. We are searching for the sites. You know, we, we are looking for the potential areas. Now, we, we have seen nearly 13, 1400 sites. Uh, nearly 2,000 Neolithic sites in between Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, um, you know, southern Maharashtra, northern Tamil Nadu. They have all been identified as Neolithic sites because they, we, the most com common denomination, uh, you know, what we call um, factor is the Neolithic silt. But this silt is a very dubious evidence. It has its beginnings as early as 3000 BC, and it continues into Iron Age, late Iron Age as well. It gradually gets, uh, you know, uh, replaced by iron tools and so on and so forth. So the most of the sites in Shavarai hill ranges in Tamil Nadu, especially, they have been identified as Neolithic sites. But actually, if you look at it, you know, th there is now a project going on uh, in, in, in Tamil Nadu archaeology department. They are looking at these sites, a systematic study. They are under the, uh, they are going with the premises that these are Neolithic sites. But uh, according to our uh, cro chronology we have established based on uh, excavation and AMS dating of uh, many of these uh, sites uh, in southern and uh, in a southern mid, mid and southern Deccan, we are very, very clear that towards uh, Andhra Pradesh, that is, you know, south, the present day western Andhra Pradesh, we have in Karnul, Anantapur and those areas, we have a distinctive tradition called Kunderu tradition, which is dated to about 1800 BC. But if you move westwards into Karnataka, most of the sites of the Neolithic are even older, go back to 25, 27, 3000 BC. But there is some pocket in this Krishna Basin area, uh, you know, to, to suggest it is the Mahbub Nagar district of present day Talangana. There are a large number of you know, these sites. Wherever we have early Neolithic sites, they continue into the later Iron Age and Megalithic uh, period and so on. There's a lot of continuity, but we are we are yet unable to say the transition from hunting gathering to early agricultural way of life, you know, and figure out at what particular point of time this transition took place because we have not been able to locate sites. Mm -hmm. uh, it can take us backwards in time and then all the sites, number of sites which have been excavated by very eminent archaeologists so far, you know, um, they tell us the story uh, where the Neolithic culture was already well established. And so we have called this an Ashmount tradition. Mm -hmm. And beyond that particular geographical area, ash mounds disappear, and then a new tradition, um, you know, we have identified as uh, Kunderu tradition, uh, dates from about 1800 BC. And from then onwards, you have this expansion of agricultural way of life going towards northern Tamil Nadu and so on. So we have to look at from the, 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 the model that we have generated for um, mid and southern Deccan Neolithic needs to be taken into account when we you know, intend to look at the presence or absence of typical Neolithic in Northern Tamil Nadu, and then related to you know, the you know, first millennium BC developments and Kiladi does not go beyond first millennium yeah. BC. That's right. You know, and these are all problems that we have. Of course, we need to go with some hypothesis and then these hypotheses always helps us to look for evidence, establish uh, scientifically, yes, our hypothesis is right. It can be put to test and it can be validated and so on. 
So that is my approach. Absolutely, that's the correct research process. That's true. Thank you, uh, Professor Ravi. I'll come back to you again. Let me uh, move on to uh, Professor Ganesh Devi. Uh, uh, Dr. Devi, uh, the as a linguist, now um, uh, the linkage between uh, the uh, or or uh, let, let me put it this way, uh, uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman's interpretation of uh, much of the uh, uh, script, the end script. Uh, how do you actually look at it? Uh, in terms of uh, you know evidence and in terms of uh, proof, there is a lot of research since the last century uh, or even the late 19th century. Uh, people have been researching into interpreting the Indus Valley script, and uh, they uh, in the context of looking at continuity of civilization. Uh, if there is uh, a correct interpretation, then uh, you know there should be a, a lot of agreement. With respect to what it means and what it, how it is interpreted, uh, scholars like uh, Astor Parpola and uh, Russian scholars, as well as uh, quite a few uh, Indian scholars, still are of the opinion that the Indus script is still not decipherable. And uh, how do we look at, you know, as a linguist, uh, understanding language and deciphering a language? What are the essential arguments or essential requirements that need to be looked at? Thank you. Uh, I feel very privileged that you asked me to participate in this very exciting discussion. I also feel very privileged in uh, listening to the presentation by Dr. Kalyan Raman and the rejoinder given by uh, Professor Kori Shetta. Uh, both these represent today complete, almost complete statements of an argument which has cropped up in India, though not in the field of archaeology and linguistics globally. Uh, so uh, it is, it, this discussion helps us to understand where the debate is going, where it wants us to go. And from that perspective, I, 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 I think uh, what you're doing is a very, very uh, useful uh, uh, experiment. Now, as a student, I remember having asked my teacher of history in first year college. What was the difference between archaeology and history? And because of my limited you know, intellectual equipment at that time, my teacher chose to say that uh, archaeology is silent history and history is uh, articulate archaeology. Uh, now, why my mind goes back to that uh, answer is in the project which Dr. Kalyan Raman has so capably articulated, undertaken change through his researches, advocated through lectures uh, through the country and outside the country, and through the efforts of his colleagues, like-minded colleagues. The intention is, the intention that is clear is to accommodate a much larger part of what is now the archeological site of knowledge into historical site of knowledge. And towards that end, to establish, attempt to establish, that the Meloha, you know, goes straight into the uh, what is now, now known as Vedic Sanskrit or later day Sanskrit, to establish the continuity and uh, through that continuity to establish the civilizational contours of what you know the term he referred to in you know the Vedic the Bharata, Bharat, Bharat, civilizational contours of Bharat. 
And his conclusion was very interesting, uh, interesting in every sense, of uh, connecting waterways to create the visualized Saraswati, bringing it right up to Gujarat, uh, which uh, in contemporary times is uh, a center of many, uh, you know, origin of many arguments. However, linguistics as it is constructed for the last 2000 years, I'm not talking only of linguistics coming from the West, but linguistics coming from Panini down to our time. All over the world, language studies, whether in medieval Europe, medieval India, early India, early Europe, have something different to say in this story. And the difference is that while India or the you know the subcontinent, and that Professor Kuru is right in because for the period that we are talking about the term India is inadequate. So in the subcontinent or in, you know, uh, our languages uh, are described more recently as a language area. And this has nothing to do about geographical area, but their interrelationship. And that many languages can be shown as standing together as languages together. Yet, the concept of language area does not rule out the fact of languages belonging to families because languages are born, they are constructed on the basis of what is previously there. And that also is the attempt here to show. So, language area does not cancel the concept of language families. Now, I mentioned this because the the uh, assumptions, the theoretical framework in Dr. Uh, Kalyandraman's uh, uh, project, uh, his mission, uh, uh, normally rules out what began with uh, normally, normally, I'm not say, speaking ex only about him, but what I know about it, normally rules out beginnings made by Asi Asiatic society, William Jones or Orientalism. I also have many disputes, many debates with uh, what the Asiatic society produced as knowledge. But I do not reject everything they produce because one thing that uh, we all need is uh, questioning everything and then accepting on the basis of evidence. Uh, so in that, you know, in the uh, linguistics, the transition of a language, family of language family remains a fact. And in India, the fact that there are different language families in India go to show without an iota about differences in chronological differences in the settlement of people. And we have now genetics to help us in the last 20 odd years. And we know the migration, part, migration routes and my, the patterns of migration of Homo sapien out of Africa. Uh, into uh, the subcontinent to the south and then again upward and uh, Andamans and so on, all that we know. But the settlement of a people and their material culture get into the formation of a language family and settlement of people in another chronological zone show another language family. And the fact that we have these in India indicate that there have been big gaps in between. That just as there, it is possible to enthusiastically establish a link, a, a sweeping link, an overwhelming link from uh, east to west or west to east, or uh, links uh, in the entire area that, uh, the, you know, the, where tin uh, went into making a bronze, uh, the, it is also necessary to take into account the gaps the geographical gaps and the chronological gaps in order to understand language continuities. There is one more 
uh, there are two more things that I want to mention. Uh, languages grow in civilizations along rivers, but their growth normally moves from the origin of the river to the you know in the direction the water flows. Uh, this is this is a rule that is followed by linguists while doing etymological exercises in linking a word with a word. Because if we are given with two dots in empty space, uh, when we join those dots, one needs to know from which dot to begin. Similarly, in etymology, uh, it is necessary to look at the non-linguistic context to decide as to which way the words flow. Now, this is necessary to mention because there's a huge debate created down the question of which way the Sanskrit language landed here. I will not get into that debate just now. Uh, the second thing I want to mention as a principle which governs all human languages, absolutely without any exception, is the semantic capacity of a language. Once a language starts going outside that, you know, one, the, 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 the payload carrying capacity of a language, in, if I may put it that way, uh, languages break down, languages break, they crack, they segregate. And that is the reason why so many languages exist today, ultimately, when those few hundred uh, you know, uh, uh, ancestors started moving out as homo sapiens. Probably they had one or very few languages, but today the world has, by a, all global lists of languages, nearly 7,000 living languages in the world. And this fragmentation of language, <coughs> reality, it happens to all languages, no language, absolutely no language is exempted from that. Even if it is uh, uh, a Purusheya, none of which is a Purusheya, but uh, all are human made, their social system, their symbolic system, but they're made by, they're man made so symbolic systems, man created symbolic systems. And therefore, they are governed by that. Going by these two, three principles which I mentioned about the family and the language area. Con uh, conflict uh, in understanding the uh, Indian situation, about the movement of languages historically in, in chronological sequence, about the semantic load carrying capacity. It is, uh, it is uh, not a viable thesis uh, to depict a language continuity for over 4,000 years, getting into additional 2,000 years when these standard Sanskrit started declining. It would be unfair, grossly unfair, to millions of people who put their genius into Pali or Buddhism, Raphuts of various kinds, or Jainism, uh, Dravidic literature and thought, grossly unfair to them to lump all of them together into a single linguistic civilizational matrix and and uh, brush aside if i'm not say wipe out brush aside uh, at least temporarily block the differences between them uh, and therefore i have great hesitation in uh, agreeing with uh, dr kalyan raman uh, one thing i agree with him uh, in in one thing in which i agree with him is his, uh, you know, uh, his uh, uh, tremendous uh, in, uh, uh, energy in gathering evidence from all disciplines. I think uh, evidence-based linguistics, evidence-based archaeology, evidence-based history, uh, uh, archaeology, history, linguistics, which accept the principle of evolution, ultimately will get in the status of scientific thesis. So uh, with this and without any uh, disrespect to Dr. Kalyan Raman's tremendous scholarship, uh, I would like to close my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Devi. Uh, I just uh, uh, want to add, uh, rather ask you another question here is, 
now that the biotechnology and genetic uh, you know science has evolved so much that uh, the recent uh, researches on dna and uh, genetic related researches more or less you know establish the migrate early migrations of human species from africa into many uh, uh, parts of the world and uh, as you said languages keep moving with people and keep evolving uh so the uh, reason and i will quote uh, again one of the uh, indian scholar in harvard wagis and narasimhan and along with about 100 odd scientists and researchers has published the uh, uh, project study that they did on using the genetic engin- you know engineering process dna studies and they clearly established the movement of people Uh, into the northwest of india in the subcontinent from uh, the region around black sea caspian sea that is one part uh, the second part is that the earliest uh, studies very clearly established that the indus valley uh, mature phase of what we discovered in harappa and mohenjadaro is a very exceptionally developed urban civilization but it went through an evolutionary process from the neolithic age over a period of nearly 5000 years or 6000 years and uh, and therefore when you now look at the vedic uh, knowledge that has come about uh, in early phase it has been oral transmission and then it moved on to the writing part and is there a gap between you know uh, when we correlate is there a connectivity between what dr kalyan pointed out between the indus uh in- interpretation and what you actually read in the or what you actually get from the uh, you know vedas as knowledge subsequent well uh, i mean uh, the, the development of script uh, and oral traditions uh, we see them as sequential uh, and it is true that scripts came in much later in human history all the history of speech is 70000 years the history of script is about 7000 years that is a, but in different parts of the world different oral traditions came into scripting at various times uh, not every language that was very mature or a society or civilization which was very advanced necessarily developed a script the english language does not have a script of its own even today it is using some roman script or that is uh, scripts uh, uh, emerge as uh, dr kalyanraman also was mentioning you know as these harappan seals the indus seals they are still not full interpreted no conclusive word on that it it is going to take uh, more excavation is collecting more of the seals more samples and then only a complete full proof accounting there have been many uh, you mentioned you know a couple of names uh, the Indi- indian names and uh, you know spanish italian european american names uh, a full proof uh, count of the indus script is still not with us either in india or outside we have to wait for it but scripts which uh, are believed to have emerged the need for script emerges in counting rather than recording phonetic signs a concept uh, and there have been different uh, styles of scripts uh, that is also uh, there are hieroglyphs are there there could be uh, the question that, no the other the other thing that you mention is uh, uh, the, the genetic studies it is true that ccmb you know, those samples and david rick's uh, work and in the indian team that worked in with him uh, they have brought in a new knowledge new new uh, thesis about the migrations and round those migration routes uh, we still have to do a complete cross checking between the uh, b- between the archaeological finds 
uh, one there is a shortage of uh, scholars in our country considering our long history and uh, civilization uh, those fields have remained neglected and there are many many gray areas uh, even today but genetic probably because it is using lab methods more dependable because there is relatively less uh, you know it's like photography relatively less scope for ambivalence gray areas interpretation yet uh, i would like to believe that 20 years from now uh, what we have by way of genetic uh, uh, evidence ge coming from genetics might look like quite primitive uh, however at the moment we have that and going by that evidence uh, the history of languages in india uh, is uh, is uh, tilted is tilted today in 2021 uh, in favor of the non sanskrit non indo aryan languages uh, in comparison to uh, what it was when suniti kumar chatterjee and others were writing in the uh, 20th century uh, it looks to me today that we have uh, learned uh, for the last 200 years to overvalue the centrality of sanskrit in india and uh, it is reflected in uh, disastrously for many castes and communities many tribes in the india uh, ma many uh, unprivileged people uh, less privileged people in india in our policy in our education and so on uh, if uh, dr kalyan raman's work uh, or such other work uh, actually helps us helps humans in this subcontinent to uh, get better justice social justice uh, that would be better rather than proving how great we have been in the past it's much better to prove how judicious we are to other human beings because our greatness lies in our humanity and compassion thank you thank you uh, uh, dr devi uh, ultimately history is meant to achieve what you actually you know summed up at the end in your comments Uh, let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Rao Mohan, uh, who's uh, exceptionally uh, knowledgeable on the scriptures and uh, uh, literature. Uh, so the Saraswati is mentioned, as I uh, read from other interpretations of the history part, is only in Book Six, as also Dr. Kajar Ravan mentioned, uh, and then it moves on to Book Ten, where. the sindhu takes over prominence and uh, so uh, in the context of establishing the historical uh, you know narrative or the historical uh, you know uh, evidence uh, identifying the evidences uh, shouldn't the importance go back to the sindhu or the indus river rather than saraswati because the veda itself veda itself mentions very rapidly how saraswati goes underground and therefore it's no more available it's a mythical river dr ramon you are on mute yourself yeah my greetings to all the experts and the you can just lower the camera so that your face is fully visible yeah yeah now it's better yes right hmm. so my greetings to all the scholars the people are deeply interested audience here We have listened to three great presentations. One by a great Indologist, the we can say is the mother of Saraswati rejuvenation, Dr. Kalyan Raman, Dr. Ravi, and Dr. Ganesh. Three different areas of Indology, archaeology, and linguistics. Of course, there have been differences of perception based on the differences of opinion, but I hope. with greater and greater evidence greater and greater research this will bear fruit and have will have an integrated result in the future we have already crossed the time limit so i will make my presentation short and it's so that we give longer to larger time for anticipation anticipated questions and clear clearances sarasthi here the doctor 
air marshal has mentioned about uh, the the mentioning of the saraswati riva and the indo saraswati in the vedic text in the rigveda saraswati is mentioned in 52 places whereas the ganga which is the most prominent holy river of today is mentioned only in two places so it back it back to say that the reality of the saraswati river you may not have any architectural evidence but a overwhelming literary evidence says that it is not a myth it's a reality and in the saraswati the devi suktam in the rigveda 10th book i think i don't have any current here so i just telling from my memory 10th uh, mandala of the rigveda i think it is 128 sukta so it right says uh, this is a talk saraswati herself talks the devi she says aham rashtrim sangamani masunam i am in this nation i am this nation of bharat i aham rashtriya i am the nation sangamani masudam through my munificence through my through my generosity i dis- distribute wealth to all the children of india that that is with the reference to the prevalence of the saraswati's great flow at that time the rigvedic time so i somehow i am unable to comprehend how it is said that it disappeared thousands of years ago uh, so it was prevalent live during the rigvedic times that's why this reference comes and then there are there are the talks about migrations that they migrated into india and are outside india in the rigvedic itself in the, uh, the there were there mentions about the war of 10 kings between the followers of sudasa of the panchala the sikraka dynasty and the pa- panchalas under the drahyu in the, the rigveda mentions that the panchalas were defeated by the ikrakus so the head of the panchala clan okay, drahyu the rigveda says he migrates out of india to westward doesn't mention about anybody migrating inward he has migrated inward it's outward westward it stops there where has he gone then a later research has been made very recently by dr hussein tamani of the california university he he is a druze muslim druze muslims are the uh, a small group of muslims a class a group of muslims who are present in three four countries like lebanon like um, the three four countries of that area and hussain tamani says the uh, druze of uh, that area west asia are actually the descendants of drahyu from drahyu the word druze has come he derives it from the fact that druze muslims are the only community among the islamic uh, religion who believe in a rebirth which is a totally anathema to the islamic culture and he says they and they most of the druze names will start with hind hind musliman hind muslim hind abdullah and then naturally they have been ostracized by the other dominant muslim groups but then it, it, there is a solid support for the theory that the, the, the migration was westward from india then migration from the north to the south due to the desiccation of the saraswati river probably in 2100 bc onwards bc onwards the two vedic works one is called uh, baudhayana sutra other is the satapada brahmana they talk about how the on the desiccation two groups of uh, people the residents moved to eastern and southern direction to and towards the ganges plateau the under madhava they moved the one group moved to the indo gendo gangetic valley other group under gautama rahuguna moved towards gouda desa so they settled there also probably the third group moved towards the konkan coast they are called the present day saraswati so the, there was the movement and further in the tamil text called purananuru
இந்த தமிழ் டெஸ்ட் கொரோனா பை அரண்மூலனார் கண்ணா அரண்மூல கண்ணாடியார் ஹி சேஸ் தட் இட் இஸ் இட் இஸ் அர்ஸ் ஐ திங்க் இட்ஸ் எயிட்டி எத் வேர்ஸ் இட் இஸ் இட் ஹி சேஸ் இது பொயட் சேஸ் அரண்மூல கண்ணாடியார் இட்ஸ் அ ட்ரிபியூட் டு த கிங் இறங்கு இறங்கோவில் he says oh to the jamma among the velur dynasty you you have uh, you 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 are, you are the you have you have been ruling over dwaraka for 40 your generation 40 generations of your ancestors have been in dwaraka dwari he calls it the dwaraka is the city the pura of uh, metal fortifications proper metal fortifications from there you have moved to tamil nadu and you have been showing your munificence in tamil nadu also so long live your dev dynasty you are a great person he distinctly refers to the, the ancestors of irungo uh, vel being from dwaraka with a city of uh, metal port and then who moved southwards to tamil nadu so as the dr kalyan ramana has been mentioning about copper so the the uh, talks about the uh, copper purification of copper and the walls were being built with copper addition it could be an exaggeration but it cannot be denied the metallurgy road had a place in ancient literature as also the movement towards the tamil nadu so this is a thing and uh, the dongs are these uh, the recent excavations of uh, the iit madras on the gulf of kambat about 20 years ago they were sent to measure the under oceanic currents but the as the kalyan raman mentioned about the haifa harbor the sunken ship which contained the hieroglyphs of uh, indus valley civilization then they, they they found a sunken ship which contained artifacts of the harappan civilization even earlier so it is still displayed at the iit madras museum it it is contain 230 art artifacts excavated from the sunken ship they could be dated to the oldest of them is dated to 7300 years ago even older than <coughs> mesopotamian civilization there there are there, there are replicas of the what you have found out in harappa like the dancing girl the potu dr kalyan ramal mentioned about the potru the priest the priest the it is a it is a something it's a metaphor for a metal worker so they it, it, they it talks about that so there there is there is also overwhelming evidence of genetics about the integral civilization which pervaded which which did not which did not does not reflect any external input because the scientist says for 15000 years it has been the same there have been differences there could be an inputs like the patina palai tamil work says about pumbuhar the capital city of kaveri uh, of cholas molipali peri molipala merigiya palidhir dayath pulambarai maakkal pulambayar maakkal kalandini dulayum muttaachirappin patinam talks about kaveri pumbuhar in that city it says there are hundreds and hundreds of foreigners who have come from the other lands molipeli pariye palidhir dayam it is a honest city where hundreds of languages are spoken from different corners of the world pulambayar maakkal the immigrants from other countries kalandu irithurayum they mix up together and they are very uh, syncretically living together muttaacharappin pattanam this is kaveri po pattanam of great uh, honor so there has been coming uh, make, uh, the migration is not the warrior or uh, they say about the people coming to invade or occupy the land driving over driving over the forces they are commercial movements there has also been movements from india the sargon the akkadian king he has given an inscription in second millennium bc where he talks about how the meluhas have come from india and have contributed richly to the development of the acadian culture so there had been intermixture and so many things are there 
and the languages of course they are great expert like uh, dr ganesh has spoken about it it could be the development through a basket of languages with a, with a root language they say it is, it is uh, something like mundalika with 8000 root words from that the 24 i astro asiatic languages have emerged though they require great research with the, all these things the, the, it requires greater and greater research but then dr kalyan raman has uh, his theory of uh, uh, his, his theory of uh, interpretation is based on the idea that they are all commercial these are the hieroglyphs are the commercial seals the see the sea seals of leading It, it it is born out of the fact that the like the excavations in the ship at the haifa harbor they they could find out the bill of lading in hieroglyphs so it could be a commercial symbol most likely he has um, developed his own logic through best fit uh, hypothesis and the uh, linguistic analysis so instead of uh, saying that it is not uh, acceptable i think we should make greater research and say how that could be made possible You, you require a greater corpus, greater, greater man. He is single-handedly doing it for about 30, 40 years. So we require a greater army of people to do that, not leave to a single person. And I compliment Air Marshal Mateshwaran for having taken up this wonderful topic, which is the need of today to that, uh, for, to knowing. It is not merely to, I, I agree with that, they have to develop the, uh, how it helps the humanity. humanity doesn't live by bread alone we require the brain also so let us get the inputs both for for the bread and brain through researches and enlightened discussion since time is running out as a as a part of the organization i think i will stop with this then we will take part further in the discussion another 20 minutes are left for discussion thank you thank you, thank you dr raman eloquent as always and uh, yes i think we have a uh, uh, all that each of you have pointed out is that there is great scope for you know uh, a lot more work to be done and lot more research uh, that needs to be done uh, so uh, before uh, you know uh, let me actually open out to the audience and uh, if there are any questions please raise your hand or you can come up uh, unmute yourself and raise the questions uh, the panelists would be very happy to delighted to answer your questions anyone there are excellent comments but they they are all comments i don't see real questions but there are lots of comments here the panelists can read them on the any questions anyone can i say something yes yes uh, professor yeah, I, yeah what has been um, enigmatic to me is the disappearance of the harappan script after 1900 bc and there is such a temporal gap between the end of the harappan script and the beginning of the brahmi uh, script in the ganges valley so what was happening in this particular time period so cultural stratigraphy uh, clearly gives us a clue that the post harappan traditions were typically aryan in nature and then till the expansion of uh, copper hoard cultures into the indus ganga divide area and further into middle ganga valley gradually gave rise to replacement by iron using peoples there and that base that laid the basis for emergence of historical civilization because you can't have an urban economy without a written language mm-hmm. and oral traditions are common among nomadic pastoral communities even today yeah. and they don't have a script at all so once the script is the hallmark of a civilization that is another you know criteria Uh, we have in mind when we want to characterize uh, you know the set of data relating to whether it is an urban economy or a you know a pre urban economy and so on and so so and then we i mean the, why the decipherment is in a big big question mark unlike the hieroglyphics or the cuneiform uh, is that we don't have so far a, a long inscription whether it is in indus script or any other script and also the essential requirement of a bilingual we have deprived of so far and these are these areas which need to be given much more attention 
in order to establish the continuity between the Harappan script and the early Brahmi script. And with respect to what we see in Tamil Nadu context is we don't see any symbol relating to Harappan, uh, you know, symbols. Uh, and although there were some claims and then the, the claims were also refuted by the people who claimed them that there are Harappan symbols on Neolithic cells and so on. But today, what we get in terms of graffiti on pottery in the context of, uh, you know, Sangam age, uh, you know, settlements in Tamil Nadu and so on, we have a typical Brahmi script, which has been systematically deciphered and there is no uh, you know, controversy. And then we see that all modern Indian scripts have their origin in the Brahmi and so on. But the same thing is not being, you know, um, possible uh, in relating the Harappan script with the, the you know, the Brahmi, early Brahmi script of the century BC and so on. I just want to ask on the same issue, uh, Professor Ravi, uh, yes. lots of uh, pottery shirts have been found all across India. From in this valley down to the south, yeah, yeah, and uh, 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 it appears that there's a fair amount of commonality in the pottery shirts. Is one issue. Huh. Uh, um, uh, the second aspect, uh, question that I want to ask is: uh, uh, the Indus Valley uh, had a burial system. I'm, I'm talking about you know uh, processing the dead, uh, and uh, if you look at lots of excavations in the peninsula. Particularly in Tamil Nadu, you will find the excavation being called a Mudumani Thali. So it's in the pots, the dead are, you know, buried. Yeah. Uh, so that practice, even in uh, lots of interior Tamil Nadu, people resort to burial system. Whereas uh, much of, you know, the Gangetic Valley development has been on cremation based disposal. And cremation is, uh, the scholars tend to associate that the beginnings of cremation practice comes with nomadic, you know, um, so how much is that? It is not really? that, exactly because if you look at some of the Ganges Valley Mesolithic sites, you know, pre Neolithic sites, there are Sarai Naharai and so on, they are known for burials, numerous burials. Mm -hmm. Sarai Naharai, Chopani Mando, Mahadaha, and so on. And then up into the Vindhyas, the south of this Ganges Valley, there you have these burials, uh, systematic burials, pit burials. And the unburials are not only peculiar to Tamil Nadu. Uh, megalithic tradition, they are also seen in the Neolithic uh, context in, uh, you know, the Neolithic of uh, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, and so on. Unburials. Then mortuary uh, ceramics were separately made, you know, like you have burial goods in the Arapans were very different from the deluxe way that we have in that context. Even here, we have these burial traditions. We, I call it megalithism. Megalithism need not necessarily refer to the emergence of stone structures, the marking the place of burial and so on. That a marked burial in order to make sure that post-mortem in the protection of the dead, uh, that was the philosophy, the intent of the burial practices which emerged. And they were all buried in the floor of the house itself because these were all very shallow pits. And the grasslands in which these settlements had come into existence were in, in, in infested by these vultures and then variety of these, you know, um, carnivore animals. They would simply dig them out and then, you know, um, destroy, I mean, eat away the carcass and so on. In order to make sure that in a post-mortem, uh, the dead body is taken care, the dead were buried in the pits in the floor of the house itself or they were also laying slabs, stone slabs on the pit. And, and then gradually we see by about 2000 BC, these urn burials, very common, very common in the Neolithic context. And they continue this tradition into Northern Deccan area in the Chalcolithic context what you know, Malwa Jorve culture from 1700 BC onwards. You have this, you know, urn burial traditions, very, very common. And then they become much more well established uh, during the Iron Age, you have burial complexes where stone structures came to be built. So this is a mortuary practice which varies from region to region, but uh, the pottery is basically, the variation is also there, and that particular megalithic pottery was, you know, wheel thrown and burnt, uh, open air kilns, and that is why you have bichrome pottery, and this is a technology which got, you know, transmitted across as the movement of peoples from one geographical area to another geographical area was taking place. And then the symbols that you see on this megalithic pottery are graffiti marks. They don't resemble these Brahmi you know, uh, letters that we have, you know, in, in li unlike in Kodumanol, um, you know, or Kiladi or elsewhere, you can identify, you can read it as a Brahmi script. 
But whereas the gram, uh, graffiti marks that are very common in the megalithic context, uh, they are just simply uh, graffiti, nothing else. And so far, we are not been able to make you know sense out of it. And that is the kind of situation. Burial practices are, have been there even among settled communities. And cremation, uh, we have you know some of these uh, megalithic burials, secondary burials. The dead was uh, cremated, and the remains of uh, the cremation were brought and you know uh, buried in a sarcophagus in a large urn or uh, you know some of these pots and so on. These are called secondary burials. Oh, yes, that's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been uh, wonderful. We are running out of time completely. Yeah. And uh, this is a huge uh, topic, extremely interesting. We can actually carry on for much longer time. I think we need to have another session sometime later. But uh, before I uh, bring to the uh, close, let me ask uh, the final comments from each one before I hand over to Dr. Kalyan Raman for his final comments. So uh, uh, just two minutes comments from each uh, of the panelists. Starting off with uh, Professor Ravi, then Dr. Devi, and then Dr. Ram Mohan. Yeah, I'm extremely happy to be part of this uh, very interesting topic. And then, of course, we expressed ourselves not to controvert or, you know, <laughs> or, you know, say that you know what you're saying we would not like to agree or disagree. But then these are viewpoints based on a body of evidence at our disposal. As an archaeologist, I look at this body of evidence from this perspective. I have these models which help me to understand and reconstruct the past based on the models, based on the methods and the data, uh, hard data that I have with me. That is my viewpoint of uh, my expression. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ravi. Dr. Devi? We'll let uh, uh, Professor Ravi speak here. Mm. Yes, Dr. Devi. Professor Ravi yeah. finished. Yeah. Well, thank you for organizing this discussion. I cannot thank you enough for doing it. But uh, this discussion, though related to very distant times, are, uh, uh, this, uh, they, these discussions are now taking center stage in shaping the identity of our civilization, our nation, who we are. Uh, at, in the last two decades of the 19th century, in Europe, a very fierce discussion emerged about who were the Aryans and from where they came. And the French and the German linguists, not archaeologists, linguists at that time, uh, stretched the origin of the Aryans to the northernmost part of Europe. And from the name of a language group or language, uh, it was actually the people, they imagined people to be Aryans there. And then the theory of pure Aryans and, uh, and those who were not so pure, mixed blood Aryans emerged. And that led to a political party devastating Europe in the 30s and 40s of the 20th century. Uh, going by that uh, not too distant historical example, in our country, where social strife erupts at the drop of a hat on the basis of a superstition or on the basis of a, a, a very fragile customs which get offended even at the mention of some word this way or that way uh, where films are being banned plays are being banned but the, the people just uh, uh, that kind of anarchic situation we have reached and therefore these discussions uh, will have to be rooted in really scientific evidence in the coming days in order to benefit our fellow citizens, and in order to make our country a great producer of knowledge, rather than producer of knowledge about our greatness. Uh, that's my feeling. I'm saying it very frankly, uh, without any uh, intention to hurt anybody's sentiments, because our sentiments are fragile and they get hurt very soon. Uh, but uh, the interest of every researcher is to get uh, unfold something that has that was not known till today, 
that is the pride of every researcher it is so for dr kalyan raman it is so for dr kori shetty it is so for uh, dr devi uh, but if research uh, if if research leads to uh, some kind of ideology which is blind to the social needs then that research has to be done uh, with sufficient sensitivity uh this is i am saying it uh, very frankly uh, let me not be misunderstood uh, i am not imputing any motives to anyone that is not my intention but i genuinely feel that humans deserve a better future and for that complete harmony complete trust are necessary in order to build that harmony and trust uh, knowledge is extremely useful and let that knowledge be fully scientifically validated and consciously argued um, even if one has to set aside one's urge to get there faster where other scientists have not got uh, thank you so much thank you uh, dr devi i uh, dr raman would, uh, would you like to say something yeah yeah last one kalidasa says a yeah, beautiful sentence he says would have been you got muted the problem you are muted you let like unmute yes the problem you are muted any unmute yes we we should be able to all these discussions research should lead to not merely synthesis also to a syncretism getting the best out of everything that is what is required as he has mentioned in the middle as dr yar marshall also mentioned in the third 30th 30s and 40s a marauding thought process drawing its inspirations from the nordic mythology and the frederick frederick nietzsche is writing and then uh, the, even the, uh, the songs of wagner it devastated the europe this is how one small a uh, wrong input can destroy the, the psychology of an entire developed cultured nation so we should be careful and then the research should be for growth and culturalization and for development and for syncretism not for destruction and all the uh, the people who are here have talked they are great people i know kalyan raman for the past 50 60 years he is one of the most remarkable person the totally selfless so people like him should inspire gangsters to develop a pure positive and objective research i am very happy to be a part of this today i have been working with the air marshal for quite some time i think he is a great leader so i am sure he will be able to develop this to greater horizon thank you thank you dr ramohan uh, dr kalyan raman final words from you and uh, you could actually address uh, uh, some of the issues uh, what dr ramohan uh, i uh, brought out uh, you now we moved away from uh, you know thank god we moved away from the uh, constructed uh, you know a uh, narrative or image that the western world had created in terms of uh, you know uh, history in terms of uh, racism in terms of why uh, you know other civilizations cannot be higher than their civilizations and i think the world is moved away there's lots of good writing so i'd like to highlight uh, the uh, you know the image or the influence of david hume and immanuel kant who both of them never moved out of their places but they heard you know narratives from travelers all across the world and then they started you know ranking civilizations and putting the white man on top and the rest of the civilization can never match up to their civilization that influenced much of history writing from the 19th century we also know that aristotelian geocentric universe ruled the uh, became remained the norm for over 1000 years and until johann kepler brought out and said okay sun is the center of the universe 
and uh, it took a long time for them to accept that. So the church wielded undue influence and control on scientific inquiry. So ultimately, we need to actually, uh, you know, focus on bringing science to the fore and uh, to the center of our research in the entire process. Dr. Kalyanraman, your final words. Thank you. It has been a fascinating evening. <laughs> I want to make a few comments on the comments that have been made. First, I would like to address Avi Shetter's, Kori Shetter's comment that Interscript died. No, Interscript did not die in 1900 BC. It continued right into the 5th century before Common Era. There are about a million coins, punchmark coins and cast coins, which continue to use the Interscript pictographs, Interscript hieroglyphs, all related to wealth resources. Mints were meant to make wealth, create wealth, using different types of coins, monetary transactions and all that. So the script did not die. If you look at the script in terms of a literary the script, it's not. It's a pictorial script, logography script, which was meant to convey wealth resource accounting that continued into the mints. So the numismatics will offer a very significant resource for identifying how the Interscript continued to live on right into the early centuries of the era, common era, number one. Number two, on the language, I entirely agree with Ganesh Diviji that we lived in a linguistic area where people are speaking different language families got together and exchanged words and borrowed rounds from one another and made them their own as part of their language structure. So that linguistic area is the Meluhai area. Number, two. Number three, the Indo-Austro-Asiatic languages like Mundarika, Santali were the root cause for the creation of the Mon Khmer languages in the Far East. This has been conclusively proved by the Hawaii University linguists. So that means we were moving far east through Mundarika, Santali, through Gautama Rahogana, who moved into the Karatoya river area in Bangladesh and we celebrated Bali Yatra every year on Kartik Purnima Day, remembering how our ancestors went into the Far East and played out their part. So we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do in terms of linguistics. We have to study the script problem in a separate presentation, which I am prepared to make for Air Marshal to organize for that. I think we will be able to resolve this contention about the identity based on language. We are all together creating a common language base which explains why even though we have got 25 languages in the country, they are all come from a so common semantic cultural root. That's all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kilian Raman. Thank you for that excellent uh, uh, you know, final comments. Uh, that brings us to the end of uh, our uh, event today. And let me uh, thank Dr. Kalyan Raman, uh, Dr. Ganesh Devi, Professor Ravi Kori Seta, and Dr. Ram Mohan for the excellent uh, you know, presentations and comments and, and interaction today. Uh, so the Peninsula Foundation is immensely thankful to you all and thankful to the audience for uh, you know, uh, taking interest. I see a lot of good comments. And uh, we will continue the history series uh, more. Our objective is to address this part, you know, in a very, very uh, focused and fruitful manner. Thank you so much to each of you. Let me invite uh, our uh, Rupal. We can give the word of thanks. Uh, thank you. It gives me immense pleasure to deliver the word of thanks for this extremely insightful discussion. And we thank all the panelists for accepting our invitation despite your very busy schedules and providing us with a better understanding about the Saraswati and Sindhu civilization. And I also thank M. Marshall Mathieswaran for moderating the event and all of the audience members for taking their time to be with her, to be with us here today. And we hope to interact with all of you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, Air Marshal. Thank Good night, you. Dr. Devi. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Ravi. Good night, Ravi. We will meet soon. Yeah. Dr. Leon Raman, thank you. And uh, Ramon, thank you. Good night, Matri. Good night, Good night. Good night. Good night.